Well, how's it going, everybody? It's good to see you all. We have three students in the room. More to come. Uh, what's the local time? He asks himself. I guess it's uh, 1248 p.m. 1248 p.m. About 12 minutes before the top of the hour. So we're starting 12 minutes early, as we typically do around here, you know. So if you're wanting to start right away with the session, with the lecture, quote unquote, that's not going to start till 12 minutes from now at one o'clock local time. So you can skip ahead. You're watching this in replay. You can you can scrub ahead. You don't have to watch this first 12 minutes. I don't know if you're new to us or not, but we always start a little bit early and uh, make sure everything's working and we say hi to a few folks and everything else. So uh, cheers to you for joining us today. Sun height. Well, let's see if we're communicating. And uh, where are you viewing from? And we'll do all that stuff. Menlo, Washington, hello. Jimbo says it's five by five. Nice to see you, thanks. Sandstone guy in West Virginia. Uh, Dallas Port, Oregon, uh, too fast now. San Diego, California. I, I think I saw Bavaria, Germany there, scroll by. Shaky South, Southern California, what? Was there an earthquake? Palmdale, California, you guys okay down there? Milwaukee, Oregon, a suburb of Portland, pre-dawn in Brisbane, Australia. That possibly was Kathy scrolling by. Watertown, uh, Minnesota, possibly. Uh, Cooley Dam, Washington. Rachel's in the Yakima Canyon. That's cool. It's a beautiful day. It's 60 degrees Fahrenheit, not a Wisp of wind. Uh, it's it is springtime officially here. I think the wind's supposed to kick up later today, but man, um, beautiful. Uh, neighbor of Jerome in Nanaimo, British Columbia. That's 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 uh, close to Jerome himself. Speaking of Kyle himself, there he is. What's up, Kyle? Uh, geologically speaking, hello, Todd. Really been enjoying your post lately. Um, Kyle's waving back at me, but Kyle, you know, I'm talking into this camera. Everybody's getting used to the drill here. All right. Edmonton, Alberta. Uh, Scott says, yeah, well, it's 92 degrees Fahrenheit and climbing here in Phoenix. Okay. You win. Good job. Good job by you. Uh, who else we got? John Stockton's house. Okay. Randy, uh, Sonora, California, Ontario, Canada. Trim, Ireland. Hello, Michael and Nee and uh, other family members. Midland, Ontario. Dayton, Ohio. SoCal in the house. Uh, Adam is in Hungary. What's the name of your town? Uh, Zigad. Great to see you, Adam. Thank you for joining us. Bavaria is listening. Hello, Claudia. That sounds uh, exotic. Uh Melbourne, Australia, magpies are singing down there, down under. Santa Cruz, California, hi, Linda. Oh, here we go. We got, the, hey, hey, hey. Yeah, we got more trickling in. Good, good, good. Selfies in Zurich, Switzerland. Uh, Jim's in Eugene, Oregon. Uh, oh, Leslie and Jim. Yeah, thank you. Sonora, Arkansas, Libby, Montana, Grants Pass, Oregon. Nice and slow now for me to be able to read. Okay, well, good. I'm glad we are. I'm glad we are functional. I'll try to stay out of your way. Uh, this is session two. Uh, we did uh, have an enjoyable uh, yes day yesterday out in the field in the Vantage area, and I did uh, film uh, segments of it. I haven't had time to uh, even look at the footage, but I, I saw enough to see that it I did it okay. There's, there's, there's sound and there's picture. So sometime this weekend, I will post that as kind of episode three. So I, I, I think uh, I'll just keep this, this number going. This is 351 session two, and video three will be this little short geology report from the vantage area. And in it, you'll see if how to get there if you want to get there. Rachel's doing more housekeeping. All right, Rachel, now we got, we got more. Can, can I help you there? Is it sticky over there too? My God, yeah. Did you wait tables? What? 
All right. Um, uh, I just I just checked the mailbox and I, I found this. Thought you might enjoy it, especially if you're a, a veteran of the scene. So this is from uh, Cheryl in uh, Bonner's Ferry, who uh, did a little bit of art. And uh, so thank you, Cheryl, for this. The room is quiet. You want to see this thing? I'll show it to you in a second. Still. Oh, you got good eyes. You can see that from there? You see my uh, my hair? <laughs> oh, I can show you guys too. <laughs> yeah, man. Yeah. So we'll pass this around. Thank you, Cheryl. Kyle, you want to see this? So thanks for joining us. We'll get started in just a couple of minutes, I suppose. I'm going to go chit-chat with the students, especially those that were out with us yesterday. Right, Lynn. I also liked that. You guys stuck around, huh? Yeah. Can Hold you on. tell by their burns? Yeah, could you, do you like my oh, yeah. oh, Oh, yeah, yeah, you were out there. Yeah, yeah. Christmas burritos. So you had, the, you had the fever, huh? You were really fine and stuff down there? No. No, you weren't. <laughs> oh, but you were out, you had other kind of fever. Fresh air fever, sun oh, yeah. fever. Yeah, it was nice to be outside. Though. Good. How long did you stick around? Uh, I think we ended up finally getting out of there about five. Oh, wow, really? Yeah, we were, nice. well, just four. before five. Because cool. by the time we were on that highway, it was Oh, before. good, good, good. Oh, you're ready for action. That's good. We got some stuff going. Yeah, we tried to color co coat some things. So. Mm -hmm. Oh, look, you got it right there. Yeah, yeah. Oh, patriotic. Mm -hmm. Nice. Yeah, oh, yeah. I was okay. thinking for more of like the, you know, crest yeah. toothpaste kind of thing. Yeah. <laughs> Did you get your uh, car fixed at the back? Yeah, right? it's going to be back. Well, it's going to be done on Friday. Okay. Oh, okay. All right. Logan? Yes. How's it going? Doing well. How are you Good. this afternoon? Doing fine. Oh, you're looking at that. Yeah. Nice. Right, Lynn. Hello. Thanks for making it up today. Yes, of course. Nice to see you again. Yeah. I'm excited to be here. Oh, good. Good. And you're Mary. Okay. That's me. <laughs> you, you guys know each other from cl previous classes? Uh, yeah, we've had a few classes together. Good. Okay, wonderful. We actually well, just had a Zoom meeting. So. Oh, you did? Oh, wow. Going from Zoom to in person. Yeah. In living color. All right. All right. Luke, what's going on? Good, how are you? Doing well. Oh, my God, look at you. Look at you, girl. Look at this. I tried printing off the scientific paper, but yeah. I got really frustrated with the printer in the search, so I just read it online. It was yeah, not great. Totally fine. Totally fine. Yeah, I, I, uh, I was just kind of slamming myself. I like printing stuff out, but yeah, I can't. Oh, you do? Yeah, I'm dyslexic, so it's kind of hard to. Oh, read. all right. Okay. Yeah. Well, we'll all find a method that works, I guess. Yeah. How's it going? Doing well. Forget, did I see you yesterday in the field? No. Oh, didn't I? What do you do? Are Fridays going to work for you? Um, I think so. Okay. Because it's every, we have class every other Friday, right. but I think it's offset on the Friday. So you're doing the 493 with, yep. with Lisa and Carrie. Yeah, I planned real hard to avoid yes. that. Yeah. <laughs> so that should work. Yes. Okay. Well, yep. good. Good. We can do it then. Your name again? Rachel. Rachel. I'll do it. Yeah, like. Alexis, Erliana, how's it going, you guys? Going good. Good. Nice day today. It is a nice day today. Um, 
you let me know if you want to go out in the field and it's not possible somehow, or if you guys have conflicts on Wednesdays or whatever the thing is. But um, yeah. You do. Okay. Are Fridays any better? Okay. 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 Good. All right. Sounds good. Yeah, you can see the outline. I'm coming to you. I'm coming. To you. I'm coming to you hot. I'm coming to you hot right away. Getting you ready mentally. Coming to you. Still learning a few names. We had most of the group out with us yesterday. It was uh, a great start. So that excellent energy that we had on Tuesday, which was the first classroom session, uh, held right over to uh, those that were out with us. And um, not everybody was with us, so I, I won't uh, I won't lean on it too hard because uh, we're still trying to build a, a vibe in here. That'll take us a couple weeks probably, both in the field and the classroom to get everybody comfortable and, and totally committed. Um, in my opinion, an undervalued part of teaching. Building a culture and a community with a group of people. It seems like often that's overlooked and you just start yakking on the first day. And, uh, it's not my style. Obviously, you tuned in last time. It's like, is this guy ever going to talk about anything real? I didn't really on Tuesday, right? But those that know about teaching know kind of we're able to grasp what I was trying to do with that group. So we got a lot of we got a lot of energy already, uh, in part to what we tried to set up last time, and then the field again was was a way to create some bonds between the groups. I see folks talking to each other that that didn't know each other even uh, at the start of yesterday. <laughs> Are you okay? Can I get you anything? Can I get you some warm tea? Okay. Well, good morning, everybody. And by good morning, I mean good afternoon. That's the second time in a row that I've made that mistake. So that's how we'll start every time. How about that? I'll always say good morning. And by that by good morning, I mean good afternoon. I'm so used to teaching in the morning, but I am glad, I am pleased that we are meeting twice a week here in this session. Thanks to many of you for joining us in the field yesterday. Those that could not make it yesterday, I remind you that we alternate between Wednesdays and Fridays. And so Next week will be our next field experience, and it will be Friday instead of Wednesday, and we'll catch a few more of you. Maybe we'll lose a couple of you. I don't know. Um, but uh, that's the plan, and uh, I won't typically refer to the field trips a ton because it's not a required part of the class, but I'll occasionally tip my hat to what we were doing and what we were seeing, and that's not to exclude those that were not there, but just to kind of involve what we saw into the experience. And for the home viewers, I will be videotaping a little bit uh, each of those so the home viewers can also see some of the field context for what we're talking about. As I discussed on our first session, which was Tuesday, and we've got everybody here again today, it's wonderful to see that. I'm coming to you in just a second, by the way. And if you haven't learned yet, uh, I'm expecting you to kind of jot this outline down as soon as you kind of get settled. It's going away, essentially. I don't know if I'll erase it technically, but it's, it's going to be rolled away. Uh, momentarily. So that'll be a nice routine. And again, I encourage you to come a little earlier if possible. I realize some of you might have a noon class, but if you can come a little bit early, not only to visit, but to get this thing down, this thing will be on on, uh, on the overhead and on the TV screens uh, starting half an hour early. So we can kind of develop that culture and get that going. This not only helps you organize your thoughts for each particular session, but it also uh, kind of gives you a, uh, an idea of what's happening right out of the gate. And today, right out of the gate, and maybe almost every time, I'm not sure, but maybe every time, maybe every session, we'll start with the lightning round. 
And what I mean by that is you were all expected to spend a little time with Jennifer Kasbaum's paper, whether you printed it out or whether you just glanced at it in a PDF form from my website. I'm going to remind you one more time how to get to these papers, and this is probably the last time that I'll do this. How do you get to these scientific papers? You go to nickzentner.com. The homepage looks like this. You go to the upper right-hand corner of the homepage of nickzentner.com. It's got nothing to do with Central, right? I like to run my own little pirate ship. So nickzentner.com, click on Geology 351 in the upper right. That will get you to this, this page here. You've got the, the visual calendar to see what we're doing, and I have not planned, uh, I'll be planning week to week, but the actual sessions, and especially our Fridays alternating with Wednesdays, will be there for you to see. Uh, but the papers will be continued to add here. I've already added a second paper from our outline today uh, that you'll be able to get your hands on uh, after class. So just we're also just trying to get into the flow of things. Of course, every class is a little bit different. Okay, I'm going to stall just a little bit more. I'm still not sure how I'm going to evaluate you because we, we are still in the middle of a pandemic. We still have a couple of folks who are attending some of these sessions virtually and some of them in person. Uh, so I, all I know so far is that on the schedule, we have a midterm on that calendar that you'll see on the web page. We do have a midterm scheduled for early May, probably the first Tuesday of May. I need everybody here for that. An old school midterm exam where you're writing essay questions, basically, essay answers to the essay questions. And, um, and a final exam, which will be the, the Tuesday of finals week. I probably should do more than just those two days but a, a lion's share of what I'm expecting from you will be evaluated on those two days. Okay. See, the energy changed already. Oh, gee, oh God, there was actually exams. I thought we were out there playing, singing Kumbaya and walking around. Yeah, we're doing plenty of that. And that's not to be diminished. What we experienced yesterday was the height of what we want to do here. And many of you were really turned on. You were really asking all sorts of questions and excitedly showing each other, and that's what we want both in this classroom setting and then out in the field. The more we can get connected that way, the better. Okay, I'm done. It's official. I'm done stalling for you, okay? I guess I'll roll it away so that you can still kind of see it, uh, but not as well as you could before. How about that? So I want to start with a rapid-fire lightning round, and you've got your top 10 list, whether it's mental or whether it's uh, kind of uh, uh, written out for yourself. And I don't want to spend the whole hour on this. And I only have a microphone on me, not uh, you all. So what I want to do is just fill the room with as many voices as possible, one at a time preferably. And uh, remember what I asked. I wanted you to write down 10 things that were new to you about that paper. If you're a rookie, it's a pretty basic kind of small message or small statement. If you're a veteran geology student, you're very intrigued by some major message that was totally new to you. Uh, and there's a lot in that paper, and there'll be a lot in all these papers. So we're going to do it right now. Okay? I don't know, five minutes, maybe a little bit more of filling the air. Who wants to get us started? Give me a statement of something you found intriguing or anything that's on your top ten list. Go. Yes. Volcanism, high, high rate of volcanism, an effusive rate or a flux rate, incredible amounts of mafic magma coming to the surface. Thanks. Let's keep going. Yeah. Kyle, Kyle says, uh, intrigued by the relationship, apparently, in this paper between this effusive rate of lots of mafic magma to the surface and an elevated carbon dioxide level uh, uh, globally. Uh, Ryan. Again, I'm going to cut some people off and just kind of put rephrase and just keep moving, but I, I love all this. Um, Ryan noted that we have mass extinction events at different times in our geologic past, many of them tied to flood basalt events globally. This is right from the abstract. About 95% of the total volume of the magma came out 
in the first million years? That was your phrase? Yes. Hayden? And that 95% came out in half the time that was previously stated. Well, I'm going to hit that one hard in just a second. You'll see what I'm about to do here. Uh, by the way, if this was a demoralizing experience, and it is for almost everybody, it's like, oh, I, was, I thought I was excited about this class, and now I'm like reading this sentence for the fourth time, and I still don't get it. I don't think this is even for me. What am I even doing? Maybe I should be become a ceramics major. I'm in the wrong major. That's not what we want to do. We're practicing learning how to pick out certain things. And then my job as the ringleader is to build a narrative from all of these things. And, and actually to say, well, some of that stuff's interesting, but we're not going to use it. Because I have particular goals that we talked about on Tuesday. Mary. So Jennifer Kasbaum, the lead author in the paper, wasn't actually getting precise dates from the basalts. She was getting stuff from, what did you say? Volcanic, volcanic ash beds that are between the basalt layers. And yesterday, you know what I mean? Not everybody was there. Yesterday, we were between two lava flows, two basalt flows. There was nothing. It was naked, baby. It was bare naked between those two lava flows. But as I said over and over and over again out there, probably too often, there are usually some ash beds or sediment horizons. Bryce was collecting some of it uh, that is between those basalt horizons. A few more and we're done with this. Tim. So we are going to get to the word zircon. We are going to get to a, a dating method called uranium lead. And that's me coming in just a second. Tim locked on that. A couple more, a couple other new voices. Uh, uh, Colton, I'm sorry if I don't have everybody's name yet. I just got some. Don't, don't, don't be uh, um, uh, offended. Colton. They sample different flows? Is that kind of what you get from that? Yeah. Oh, they didn't pick just one sedimentary horizon between these Columbia River basalt lavas. There, there were multiple horizons, but again, we're staying, Jennifer was staying away from the basalts. We'll comment on that for just a second. Uh, Jesse, no, Tessie, no, Jess, Tess, what the hell? What's your name? Oh, I'm sorry. No, no, no. You're over there. Uh, you got a mask on. Don't, I, wait, I can't do it. Go ahead. Your name? Rhiannon. Re, call me Re. How many times did you say that yesterday? Just call me Re, dumbass. <laughs> Sorry, Patrick. Re? Oh, this is more of a Washington, this is more than just a Washington story. Re is picking up on the fact this is a regional story that has regional implications. And yes, we'll hit that pretty hard too. Three more. Luke. Uh, the, the, the time between eruptions, they were... Uh, yes, not this, it's, not a, it's not an on-off switch on this system. Uh, there's variability and still some questions, still some uncertainty about how much time is elapsing between lavas. This is perfect. This is just what I'm after. Two more and we're done. Preferably new voices who haven't spoken yet. Uh, Matthew. Uh, looking at figure four... This is more something I was a little confused. In my it's okay. Let's go for it. Um, it. It was kind of confusing. Why didn't they like correlate, not correlate, but line up the magmatic or the, the reversals yep. and the polarity with the dates and the measured uh, reversals of polarity in the field earlier? Versus doing it now sure. Let me help with that. So, so, so there's lots in there that we will de-emphasize in just a second. One of them is the the magnetic reversal history of our planet. Did you catch that? That maybe you're unaware, but these basalts have a way of recording the Earth's magnetic field when they are erupting. And this is during a time when there's a lot of basalt coming out, and it's during a time when you can have the Earth's magnetic field completely flip from a normal polarity to a reverse polarity. And they were refining some dates and therefore saying that we're going to help uh, uh, 
make the magnetic flipping history a little bit more accurate for this particular part of the geologic time scale. So you were confused why they weren't kind of matching them perfectly and because there's, there's some work to do yet. But these new dates are so precise, laughably precise compared to what we had before that we can get a little bit more uh, constrained time. What did I say? One more? One more. Uh, this is Jesse. Yeah. Thank you. I didn't catch that at all. Who, somebody else? Astronomical tuning? Yeah. What's up, Tim? Uh, well, I ran well. Yeah. I you're, you're confused too? So am I. I didn't even catch it. Oh, that's probably why I, I, I tuned it out. Okay. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Beyond me, I, I, I was so tuned out of that that I just I went on to the next whatever. Last comment, and then we'll come to my part of it. So thank you. Perfectly done. We'll do this, I think, almost every time. I'll be assigning a paper for Tuesday, and you're like, this is a three-credit class. I'm not reading a scientific paper twice a week. You're right, you're not. Do you remember the approach that I suggested? We're not reading every sentence. I mean, that was how I approached reading a scientific paper, but quite often, that's the end of it. Maybe you assume that that was just like to get, clear my throat and get ready, and then I like read for five more hours and I read every freaking word. Uh-uh. Only if I'm totally invested in learning what I can from that particular author. There'll be a couple like that. But I, I'm, I'm not, uh, you know, quizzing you on page three. What was the caption in the third sentence? Baloney, okay? So you'll, as we do this, first of all, you need to be prepared, and, and you all were. The second pass is getting comfortable with these papers and know how to draw certain things out and then see how I like to use some of that data. Okay, most of you are totally switched on, and let's go ahead and do something with it. What's on the outline next? We just did the CASBOM paper, and you, I think, is what I said on the outline. What's next? CRBG plus YHS, quick and dirty. All right, so this is a 351 class. I'm assuming you've been introduced to the Columbia River Basalt Lavas. I assume you've been introduced to the Yellowstone Hotspot. But as I've gotten to know some of you over the last couple of days, especially walking and talking with some of you, I realize we have even more of a spread of backgrounds than I originally thought. So I think that I will always have a couple of links. So in other words, if you go to this video in replay, down below the video is a little description, and I have two links there. One link is... You click on it, watch another lecture, just for background information. And that's essentially what I would expect you to know. It's called Flood Basalts of the Pacific Northwest. It's a lecture I gave three years ago. So you can watch that if you're feeling like this is way too fast, or you have no background to, to keep up with what's going on. We're not doing it all here again, of course. So occasionally I'll say, watch, I put it in your homework, watch this lecture, and you'll watch it if you feel like you, you need that background. This, while I'm thinking about it, the second thing I have in the course description is an interview and um, I guess it's just an interview. It's a video interview with Emily Cahoon. Uh, this is right before the pandemic began and Emily was finishing up her PhD at Oregon State University, uh, no, Portland State University. And she said, I listened to your podcast and it'd be fun if we did an episode. I got an idea for a podcast on sunstones. I'm like, Oh, okay. Yeah, sure. And I said, well, how do we, can we do it in the, like in video? This is so old. This is like January, 2020. She's like, yeah, I think we'll do it on Zoom. I'm like, what? I don't know what that is. <laughs> so I like download Zoom and try to figure out how to get a microphone. Anyway, this thing exists on YouTube, uh, the video conversation. And she is the author of this paper that, uh, I'm assigning to you uh, for you to read over the weekend and get ready for Tuesday. And you'll see how she fits into the story in just a second. Okay, I promise I won't give you all this background every time. We're still in the first week of class, but we're getting 
uh, a feeling for how we're doing this. Here we go. There's a bunch of basalts that are in the Pacific Northwest, and they are the Columbia River Basalt Group, CRBG. That's an incredible collection of basalt lavas, flood basalts. Flood basalts around the world, as you read in the paper, are usually tied to a mantle plume. Mantle plume, also known as a hotspot. So there's a mantle plume tied to the flood basalts in India. There's a mantle plume tied to the flood basalts here in the Pacific Northwest, and so on. Our, our mantle plume, responsible for our flood basalts, the Columbia River Basalt Group, is the Yellowstone hotspot, but it ain't here anymore. The Yellowstone hotspot today is in Wyoming, and I'm drawing a circle because there's an explosive caldera from that most recent volcanic event in the Yellowstone story. So the mantle plume is here today, but if we go back in time, we can follow that mantle plume back to northern Nevada and extreme southeastern Oregon at the time of Jennifer Kasbaum's paper. In other words, in the neighborhood of 16 million years. We're going to look at those dates more carefully in just a second. And you're like, well, wait a minute. What are these things? These are calderas. Calderas are tied to rhyolites or felsic or silicic events. But as I mentioned very quickly last time, we're going to be talking quite a bit about bimodal volcanism this quarter, where you have two opposite types of lava associated with the same system. So without being careful about it yet, the Yellowstone hotspot story the Yellowstone mantle plume story has been regularly producing both basalts and rhyolites. Basalts and rhyolites. We got an igneous crust. Oh, what? Why not? Skipping ahead just a second. So, this is from Geology 101 Lab. I'm only going to show it a couple of seconds because it should be very familiar to you. But we have silica content below. Many of you are shaking your head now. You're feeling comfortable, finally. You, you, this isn't a scientific paper. Hell, this is something you, you learned three years ago or whatever. So the lowest possible silica content in the world is 45% silica magmas. Those are mafic magmas. If they erupt out of a volcano, they're basalt lavas, our topic today. If they stay underground, they're, they're gabbros. All the way up to 80% silicas, extremely high silica magmas, rhyolites, we call them either felsic or silicic. Uh, Jennifer was talking about silicic centers. And some of her, most of her sampling was done in this silicic material, this felsic material in the interbits. Specifically, the vantage horizon, one of her samples, Jennifer Kasbaum I'm talking about, came from some pumice clasts. And pumice is quite often very silicic or very felsic, meaning it's got a lot of silica within it. There's all sorts of ranges in between that are pretty much absent from our story. Well, hold on a second. Hold on just a damn second. What did I say on our first day? What was our target time window? Between what and what? 40 to 60, or if you swing this way, 60 to 40, baby. Is the Columbia River Basalt Group between 60 and 40? No, it's too young. This is a too young situation. These lavas we saw yesterday, those basalt, it's too young. Get this stuff out of my face. It's too young. 16. Why are we talking about this? Here's the reason. And I thought it was just going to be the first week, but I got to say, I think it's the first two weeks. I think we're going to do more Columbia River Basalt Group and you'll see why in a second, next week. A, because all the good rhyolites of the Tianaway Formation are still under snow. And B, I'm starting to see that if we can do, if we can read and learn together about this brand new work done on the Columbia River Basalt Lavas that are bimodal, Hello, there are some rhyolites that I knew nothing about until a couple months ago that are in this story of the Columbia River Basalt Group. Rhyolites. 
And you're just like, oh, of course it's rhyolite. You just told me this is rhyolite here. I didn't know there were rhyolites in the Pacific Northwest. I didn't know anything about the strawberry volcanics, for instance. There's a range called the Strawberry Mountains in Central Oregon. And I just decided last night, I think I, maybe we'll spend another week on this and really try to learn our chops on bimodal volcanism. It's too young. It's too young. It's too young for 60 to 40. But that's the current plan. If we spend two full weeks on this Miocene volcanic system, then we go to our magic window of 60 to 40. And we go in that sweet spot that I had on the map for you last time. Remember, between Wenatchee and Leavenworth and Blewett Pass and, and Ellensburg, I guess. And there's bimodal volcanism with the Tianaway Formation. And that's really our target. That's why we're spending so much time on the Columbia River Basalt Group. Okay, let me finish my quick and dirty story. So if we go essentially 17 million years ago, that's the beginning of our story where we have fissures, deep cracks that are forming, and flood basalts coming out of these fissures. These are known sources, and these are known cracks, and these are known feeder dikes that have fed these Columbia River basalts. Since the hot spot is way over here now, because North America is drifting to the southwest over the stationary mantle plume, this is no longer an active system. But when the mantle plume was in the neighborhood, quote unquote, we obviously had the basalts, that's the flood basalts of the Pacific Northwest lecture, but what you will not hear about, because I didn't know anything about it three years ago, is this rhyolite stuff. And that's what I want to learn about with you next week. Okay, we're moving on. What I want to do with Jennifer's paper is give you a little backstory on the significance of her high precision dates. Who wants to say something right now? Anybody, anybody want to say anything? Energy's good. We okay? Okay. So, you know, I, I've, I'm trying, I'm going to show you a bunch of slides and pictures and everything else. And I kind of like this, just assigning videos that I've done that are kind of an extra textbook for us. And there's lots of visuals that you can see on your own. I think I'm still going old school here. But what I want to help you see is that I've been teaching about the Columbia River basalts for 30 years. I've been here 30 years. I told you that last time. And the dates have changed. So this is one of my first old course book uh, uh, collections. And for 20 years, I had these dates memorized. Of course, I don't know anymore because I got to remember some new dates. But what I want to help you see is this stratigraphy. So some of you are busy copying this down already, and I'm going to do a bunch of stuff over here on the right. To put the Casbon paper into perspective with how these dates have gotten dramatically improved and more high, uh, uh, how the dates have become uh, full of precision that we did not have before. What is this? This is the stratigraphy of the Columbia River basalt group. So in geology, we have formal designations. This is the group, the Columbia River basalt group. It's all of the volcanic rocks in this system from bottom to top, the earliest or the initial phase of the eruption. So this is a system, apparently, you'll see how Emily Cahoon is helping us maybe change this story. But this appears to be a flood basalt system, the Columbia basalt group, that warmed up slowly. That the initial phase of the eruptions were not the most voluminous that Ryan and a couple others were talking about these crazy volumes of mafic magma pouring out of the earth. That's not till the main phase, the grand run of the big boys, the big girls coming out of these fissures. And then there is a waning phase as well. So these five names are subdivisions within this group. We call these subdivisions formations with a capital F. 
So this is just a little bit of nomenclature, which I assume you've had before if you've been in geology classes uh, for much of your career with us. You can take a group subdivided into formations, the Wanapum formation, the Grand Ronde formation, the Steens formation. In each formation, and this is, if you'll, if you'll reread re Kasbaum, you'll see her designating it this way. So the five formations are broken into smaller units yet called members. Did anybody catch the most famous of the members within the Grand Ronde formation that she was very impressed by? It's not just her, but she confirmed that this particular member, many of you are furiously looking through the paper right now, uh, it's named after a location, and it is on par with some of the greatest individual flows from these other flood basalt areas. Ryan was impressed with the fact that Siberia and these other places have you know, incredible flood basalts too, and they do. And India and Siberia and a few other places have way more of a group than we do voluminously. Ours is kind of a small flood basalt province, if you must know compared to some other places worldwide. But if you go down to individual members, individual flows, and look and you calculate the volume of individual flows, like this one right here called what? Yeah, that's it. Uh, I might, I mean, I'm, I'm going to race it in just a second. I'm going to do some numbers here, but uh, what was it? A wash? Oh, 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 oh. W-A-P. Shilla. Thank you, Rachel. The Wapshilla Ridge. I don't know where the Wap. Oh, you know what I did an hour ago. Alexa, where's the Wapshilla Ridge? She's like, the Wapshilla Ridge is on Uranus. <laughs> I'm like, Alexa, where's my anus? She said, you'll have to figure that one out. Okay. It's a ridge over in the Hell's Canyon area on the Idaho side of the Snake River. And many of you know that we have, a, again, a tradition of naming uh, members or even formations after places where they are best exposed or sometimes first exposed uh, for study. So there's a Grand Ronde River Canyon that shows many of these Grand Ronde flows. But it is this Wap Wapshilla Ridge member that's a monster. And it's just one of dozens and dozens. And if you read the fine print, I think there are in, up to dozens of flows just within a member. So you can get more than, th you do get more than 300 of these individual flows making up this incredible German chocolate cake here from top to bottom. Okay, let's get to what I want to do really. So this is going away. And again, if you've got something that you were fascinated by or you feel like I'm skimming over that was super interesting to you, by all means... Um, so when I first started teaching the Columbia River Basalts, I used the best dates I could. I had these five formation names. That, that hasn't changed. That's still with us. That was in, in Jennifer's paper, right? The colors on the map and everything else. But my initial dates that I would commit to memory and teach with my eyes closed in millions of years... Oh, I'm getting nostalgic now. I haven't used those numbers in a long, long time, probably more than 20 years. Back in the 90s, when I was teaching Columbia River Basalts, I'm saying, you know, this, this whole system started 17.5 million years ago. These are the old dates. These are potassium argon dates. These are a particular absolute age system coming from, um, I'm not even sure which mineral. I guess they're from the feldspars in the basalts. But the error bars are crazy. And, and everybody agreed even at the time, we can do better with the precision of these dates. But these numbers are what we use for a hell of a long time. And if you look at a geologic paper from 1985 or something, or maybe earlier, uh, you'll find these dates. And if you're a rookie, we're starting the whole system. We're starting some of those fissures 17.5 million years ago. And we're ending the system 6 million years ago. But the number that I always used was 90%, this is back with these dates, 90% of this system came out in a one million year span, pretty much like uh, uh, 
somebody just said, forgot who said it, but coming out in, in a million year span. But notice one of the main points from the quote unquote old way of teaching this is that the system had to warm up, that the initial phase was not cranking out a lot of stuff, and it's a full million years after we start this system that we get the incredible mafic magmas coming out of the ground. I don't know if you caught it, and I think I read this correctly in Jennifer's paper. Did you catch it? I think she said that if you go to other flood basalt areas of the world, the biggest, baddest flows are right away. Tim, a couple are nodding your head. You maybe saw that. Maybe it was reading into it because that's what we're about to go to. Jennifer is helping us see, and Emily, who we'll finish with today, is helping us see that we can do better not only with the dates, but with some of the assignments of these formations. I'll, why not? I've got you. It's starting to look with this brand new research that this system maybe did start full bore, like other flood basalt areas. And it's just been a question of mapping and a question about precise dates to give us maybe a slightly delayed story that I've been teaching forever that maybe is not as accurate as we can. I don't want to belabor this forever, but I don't, let's say 20 years ago, I said, oh, I saw some new work, some new scientific papers. We got some new dates. This is pre-Jennifer. This is PJ. Okay? It's like, ah, you know, students, maybe it would be a quarter or two, or I'm like, I forgot to change the dates in my course pack. Would you please change these? And so... I'll just do this very quickly because I don't want to go crazy with it. But now a slightly better dating technique using two isotopes of argon. Now, some of you are fresh out of geochem and mineralogy, and you know this stuff better than I do. I don't know much about geochronology. And I've, I've, I've never got samples run through a, a system like we have upstairs. So some of you are ahead of me, maybe most. But this argon-argon dating using isotope 40 of argon then uh, with a ratio to argon 30, 39 gave us slightly more precise dates, still with some error. And you're like, oh, come on, it doesn't change the story that much. Well. I don't know, Matthew, if we're trying to correlate with magnetic field reversals, or Kyle, if we're trying to correlate with the mid-Miocene climatic optimum and we have very precise dates for elevated CO2s, this is an important story. And that's obviously what Jennifer and her co-author were trying to do. We've got these great dates now, and they appear to work better with these global phenomena that we're seeing. And we have a stronger case that we can tie the Columbia River basalt, flood basalt story with these global phenomena. Are these Jennifer's dates? No. When did her paper come out? Three years ago. So I got to change my dates again. And I think I did most recently in the yellow book I used last quarter. They're brand new dates and they're coming right from Jennifer. And whoever said it, I'm sorry who said it. She's saying, okay, I'm going to go, I'm going to use some argon, argon dating again. But I'm also going to use a lab at Princeton, where she's from, that specializes in high precision dating of zircon crystals, a mineral called zircon, using uranium lead. And I mean, did you catch the precision on some of these dates? I mean, we are down to a gnat's ass with these dates. It is almost unbelievable. Sorry, Patrick. Has anybody got a date written down, including the, the plus or minus? Like, if you got it in front of you, I'm, I'm on figure three. And first of all, in figure three, I don't know if it's handy for you, but we've got, it's color-coded by the, the five formations we're talking about today. And if you didn't catch it, the yellow stars are the actual sample sites. Uh, can you see the yellow star? Uh, just play along if you can't see it in front of you, or maybe look on with a neighbor. Uh, there is a yellow star on figure three 
that's right on the boundary between green Grand Ronde and pink Wanapum. That's where we're hiking yesterday. We were hiking very close to that major boundary between the Grand Ronde and the Wanapum. It's called the Vantage Interbed. I'm still on this page. You see photo D. That's from us. That's from Kittitas County. She traveled from frickin' New Jersey to come to Vantage to get a burger at uh, the place and then go sample pumice class in the Vantage Sedimentary Horizon, sample CRB1533. What's the date? What date did she get from the pumice class in the Vantage Sediment, which is truly at the boundary between the Grand Ronde and the Wanapum? Anybody got it? 16.066 plus or minus 0 0.40 million years. How many years is that? 0 0.04 million. It's 40,000 years. My great uncle's 40,000 years old. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's incredibly precise. And I ran out of time, but I'm, I was going to try to look up the error bars we had from 30 years ago. It, it wasn't 40,000 years. Isn't there something even more precise than that? 34,000, plus or minus 19,000 years. That's the uh, zircon that she found up there at the top of the Wanapum. I mean, God, this is just, I mean, I've truly talked to some older geologists who are open-minded people, and they're like, I can't believe they're that precise. They, I, don't, I don't know what they're doing. I can't be that precise. So you're hearing my message, that there's a new generation of folks with some new tools, some new techniques. Can't give you the details, but they're coming up with these dates that are, a, I think, a major leap forward in precision. And I can't hold it. She's from Princeton. This guy, Mike Eddy, who you'll get sick about hearing about. You saw this cartoon being passed around with Brian Atwater's name. Well, it's going to be Mike Eddy, Mike Eddy, Mike Eddy, the whole corridor. Michael Eddy was also part of this research group. Michael Eddy also has this high-precision uranium-lead zircon ability with these crazy precise dates. I'm not killing time here, man. I'm setting this up. I know where we're going. And we're going to dates like this from the Chumstick Formation outside of Leavenworth, at Peshastan Pinnacles, outside of Wenatchee, from this same group at Sam Bowering's lab at Princeton. And he's the guy, Mike Eddy, that I'm associated with now that I will be their public outreach person in the next few years. So part of this is selfish. I want to learn his stuff so that I don't make an ass of myself this summer when we're sitting around the campfire. I'm like, oh, so what have you been doing, Mike? I sent you all the papers, haven't you? Well, you know, I, <laughs> I just, you know, I, I make videos of myself uh, having breakfast. So, you know, what a mistake. Who is this maroon? Okay, so I got to write down to be complete. Jennifer's dates, you've got them. Seven, this is, this, is, this is cutting edge now. This is three years old. And you're like, well, aren't you going to change it again in five years? Probably. I don't know. I don't know if we'll get any more precise than this, but you know it's dangerous just to say we're at the crest of civilization here. We'll never learn anything more. Baloney. You want to help me here? You got the, Somebody got these written down? What's the boundary between the Steens and the Naha? It's not 16.7 anymore. Ah, let's do it. 16.6, 16.5, 16.1. According to Jennifer's work with uranium lead on the zircons from the interbeds, not the basalts themselves. 15.9, 16.2. So who said our 95% thing? Uh Help me. Your name, I'm sorry? Ariel. Ariel, thank you. And you said 95%. Wasn't it between those two dates there? That's in the abstract. 95% of the Columbia River Basalt Group magmas came out between 16.7 and 15.9 and somebody else chipped in, that's twice as much magma, or came out in, how do you say it? 
It came out in half the time that we thought before. That's one way to say it. Yes, right. Re. re. The, the magma, the mafic magma of this system in this uh, time window came out 2.5 times as fast as previously thought. 2.4, thank you. Plus or minus 40,000 years. Just kidding. Okay? And you're like, again, who cares? Well, again, this is a different message than my 90% coming out over the course of this. And it also helps us see these interbeds a little bit more. But more interesting going to the vantage sediment. Now, are we going to go to the vantage sediment? Probably not. I don't think that's going to be as nice a hike as we had yesterday. I got a couple ideas for where we might go a week from tomorrow. Rachel. Um, is the vantage sediment visible from the vantage highway when you're going to Cinco? Because there's some roads that with some really nice white sediment around pillows on top of it. That's it. That's it. The type locality. So Rachel's wondering, has she seen the vantage sediment before? Do you know the old vantage highway instead of the freeway? And if you go to downtown Vantage, you know, you got crosswalks and stoplights and everything. Obviously, it's a huge metropolis. Har har. And then you start heading towards Ellensburg on the old Vantage Highway. Uh, it's one of the first outcrops you see on the north side of the road. That's it. There's some beautiful pillows. We looked at pillows yesterday, but not that horizon. And that white stuff is type locality of the Vantage horizon. I don't know if that's where she took photo D, uh, but maybe. Yeah. So pretty important paper, regional implications, Kittitas County, baby. I. Who else wants to say anything about this before we mop up? I've done kind of the major things I wanted to do today. I wrote this this morning. Tim? I have a quick question yeah. figure one. Sure. Figure one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So Tim's wondering about figure one, and there's these gray circular things. Uh, I think they're vague on purpose. McDermott is a caldera. I guess, but I don't know about the Lake Owyhee. Obviously, this wasn't the major focus of their paper. Otherwise, they would have done more with it. Yeah. No, and that's, that's kind of where we're going. You know what? Thank you. We're going to use this as well. I don't know, you know. Uh, maybe... Just programmatically, I think I do want to do a little bit more of this uh, each time we meet, where I'm referring to a particular figure, et cetera. And I don't want to do all this either. So can we get ourselves rigged up? Some of have a laptop open. Maybe you got the PDF in front of you, or if you print it out. you. But can we kind of be in the habit of doing that? And we, I think it might be helpful. And our home viewers who are really into it will also have the paper in front of them somehow. So instead of doing this, we'll just kind of refer. So we're kind of limping along today because we're not totally set up for that. But that's, I think that's what we'll, we'll shoot for is starting this Tuesday. I'm not going to get to you right now, Ryan, because I want to. Oh, go ahead. Well, I was just wondering about the um, uh, magnetic versus inertial stuff. Yeah. My ACL is uh, bullshit, right? Yeah. It is. It's a surprising number of magnetic reversals during this story that we're talking about. And quite often when you're out in the field in the old days, when I first learned this stuff, you're like, where are we? With, like in the Yakima Canyon, where are we in the Grand? This is mostly Grand Ronde lavas, right? Yeah. So where are we in the Grand Ronde? We weren't using Wapsilla, whatever, you know. Uh, he's like, well, this is either the N2 or the R, the R2 or the N1 or the R1. In other words, normal polarity, reverse polarity. So even within the Grand Ronde, there are multiple reversals. And that was the only way to tell these flows apart. If you weren't doing geochemistry, you were just truly using a field magnetometer and figuring out the orientation of the particles. I don't want to go any further with that, though. Thank you. Um, so I want to not only address Tim's thing, but set us up with the last three minutes with Emily Cahoon. Okay. So on the, I just said I wasn't going to do this. Now I am, I guess. So on this map, there are these gray areas. 
which I need to learn more about. That's what Tim is asking about. We know the five colors are our basalts. There's some rhyolites down here in Oregon that are part of this Columbia River basalt story. And that's where we're going next week. We're going to Oregon, not really. We're going mentally to Oregon. And a first step to go to Oregon is to go to the other paper that's on your outline. This is the gal that introduced me to Zoom and we did the video podcast. It's also an audio podcast as well. So if you go to the website, it's there now. The paper is called Reshuffling the Columbia River Basalt Chronology Picture Gorge Basalt, the earliest and longest erupting formation. It's a short paper, same idea. What am I expecting you to do? Read the abstract twice, print the thing out if you want, red pen if you want. Okay, we got more maps, but I'll give you a sneak peek. Emily's still dealing with basalt. Emily Cahoon is still dealing with basalt. But she's realizing, oh God, I gotta find the, I gotta find my note. Uh oh, uh oh, uh oh, daddy can't find his notes. Oh boy. It's a half sheet of paper. I gotta go to her paper, I guess, because I can't find my notes. The picture gorge basalts. There's a place called Picture Gorge. It's near John Day, Oregon. The Picture Gorge basalts, up until recently, have been put in with the Grand Ronde. So they're not included in our five formation things because it's kind of a local story. I'd heard about the Picture Gorge basalts, didn't know what to do with them really. Emily was working with the Picture Gorge basalts and dating the ground mass. So some of you from Rocks and Minerals remember that you have a volcanic rock like a basalt. You have phenocrist, the big vis visible feldspars or something like that. And then you've got all the really microscopic minerals that you can't see with the naked eye. That's the background. That's the matrix. That's the ground mass. As you'll see in the video podcast, she talked carefully about getting dates from the ground mass, which are a little bit more accurate than getting dates from the phenocris, or the actual feldspar crystals within the picture gorge basalts. Wait for it, wait for it, because daddy can't find his notes. Awkward silence. Daddy, what, what is it, what, what? She has a surprising, a surprisingly large age range just from the picture gorge basalts in central Oregon. Her oldest, I'm getting excited, I'm getting chills. Her oldest, this is where we'll start on Tuesday, her oldest picture gorge basalt, 17.25 million. What should be up here in the Grand Ronde in central Oregon is older than the beginning of the Steens traditionally. And her youngest date within the picture gorge basalt, 16 even. So if we're using Jennifer, which in the old days, back when Jennifer wrote her paper in 2018, we had the end of the Grand Ronde at 16.1. Again, you'll see in the paper, Emily Cahoon has brand new work saying that we have lavas basalts in central Oregon that started erupting before the beginning of the traditional Steen story and going all the way up to 16.0 million years ago in the Wanapum story. Are you realizing why I'm excited as we finish? Maybe our main phase, according to Emily and a few other new workers, maybe our main phase is a large footprint that is not just in Southern Oregon and Northern Nevada. That's how we'll finish. Give me two more minutes. I know you don't have a two o'clock class because you registered for this, one to five. Sorry. <laughs> That's dirty. I did you dirty right there. This is back to the quick and dirty. Not all of these fissures are the same age. Most of you have heard this before. We have a convincing story about our flood basalts being tied to the Yellowstone hotspot because traditionally 
the earliest cracks, the Steens fissures, are down here next to the Yellowstone hotspot. That's initial phase. Imnaha, initial phase. By the time we get to the main phase, Grand Run and the Washilla, whatever, we're way up here. How come? If the source, if the mantle plume is down here, why don't we have our biggest, most voluminous lavas coming out initially? That's always been a puzzle. This new work by Emily Cahoon and others are saying, we've probably mapped, geochemed, if that's a verb, and come up with dates not as precisely as we could. And maybe there is a broad beginning like there should be in other places in the world. Maybe we did have a main phase right off the bat. We just haven't been looking at it correctly. We didn't have the right data. A most, uh, we didn't have the most precise, complete data to tell that story. Okay, mercifully, I'm done. And I'm pausing because I'm not entirely sure we're going to Oregon next week to continue the Columbia River Basalt Group. But if we do, it will be to continue to learn bimodal signatures with these two young lavas. And then we'll start heading north of Ellensburg. If we don't go back to Oregon, I'll have another bright idea over the weekend and we'll, uh, we'll, we'll put it in, the, we'll, we'll accelerate to the Eocene, which is between 60 and 40. Thank you, that was a good session. I enjoyed it very much. I hope that you did too. We're done for the week. I'll see you Tuesday. Please read the Emily Cahoon paper and be ready to do a lightning round when we start Tuesday at one o'clock. I love you. Well, make sure you're ready with your, your, your top 10 list from the paper, then the uh, interview is just fun. Nick, Thank you. Where are you guys looking at rhyolites up north? Is that what you're doing? Yeah, I'll, I'll be with you guys in just a second. Um, I've never, I've, I've just started tracking down those outcrops. Okay, because I have one for you. You have one. I did, in mineralogy, I did my project on a rhyolitic dike of Corbailey Canyon on Highway 2 just outside of Arondo. And really? since they just had a rock fall there, I bet it's going to be pristine rock faces. Whoa. Yeah, I have a chunk if you want to look at it. I'd love to. Okay, cool. Did someone suggest you do that for a project? No, my boyfriend and I were driving back from Spokane and took Highway 2 and just beautiful outcrops. Right. So I decided to do that. Well, that's amazing. Yeah. So if you want any info on I'd that, love, I'd I love, I would love, paper. you did. Yeah. I'd love to see it. Okay. Cool. Yeah. You can you can you can uh, you can lead us out there. Okay. Oh well, I can't because Wednesdays and Fridays I have class. <laughs> Excuse me. Oh boy. Um, two things. One was just a curiosity question, yeah. but uh, or well, the first one was I'm curious about the Eddy paper. Eventually yeah. Eventually, when we get to it, because yeah. I think I might have read that for my mineralogy class when I was first given my sample of sandstone from the. Swap well, maybe so. You know, Chris so, Mattinson was kind of uh, into the exotic terrain yeah. stuff that we were doing before Christmas. So maybe he got fired up enough to, to do some reading in that class. Yeah. So I don't know. It, it, well, the name is there. It's Eddie, yeah. and I've used it for my mineral class. Yeah. So I'm just curious. But okay. anyway, the second one I was saying yeah. is in the reading here, it was right. something that said that in the introduction, the Columbia River CBRGs right. are the youngest, most well preserved of these flood basalts that we really know and work with. Yes. So, you know, I was kind of wondering, you know, it stated that these other ones, like the Dakon traps, the Siberian traps, right. you said that they start with an initial an initial phase of, I guess, of production. Yeah. But I was gonna say, like again, I haven't read anything right. about them. I would have right. to go do it. But it seems interesting to me that we're taking information from older maybe not as well precise or as well preserved right floods, right and applying the same kind of thinking to this one which is rather preserved but again i got to read this paper and see maybe the different ordering it is suggesting that that does start out really you know really it, it, it i see what you're saying and in general yeah. you know you do try to compare with context you try mm -hmm. to get other global examples but mm -hmm. Of course, you, you you just work with the evidence you've got, right. and I think it is accurate to say that our precision is, I'm guessing, significantly mm -hmm. higher in precision than other places. Gotcha. And so, 
it may be just a question of applying this this new technique to those other places. Yeah, it might be cool to see like you know right. how, what we take from here and how right. we can learn from those and yeah. apply to those spots. Okay, Very good, Tim. Awesome. Okay, okay, thank you, man. Josh gets the uh, zircon dating now. Right. Yeah. Well, I was just wondering if we're going to touch on that magnetic reversal thing anymore, just because it's. I don't. I don't have much for you. No, we're not. You're into that's it. That's like a thing that. I, well, no, it's 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 an aspect. It, my dad brings that up all the time when we're talking about weird stuff from the past. You know what sure. I mean? Sure. Be like, you know, all that all that stuff. You know. Like, why did you run out of that Dairy Queen bare naked? What was the magnetic reversal, Dad? That's that's why. <laughs> okay, I hear you. I don't. Yeah. So I was just hoping maybe I could like. Because I don't know how often they're supposed to happen generally, but I know they've happened multiple I'll times. I'll tell you what. I, I'm going to go visit with the home crowd. Okay. Go right now, past the intro lab room. Right. You'll see a huge intro poster of... on that side of the hallway, right? Yeah, man. Right side? Okay. Yeah. There's a big geologic time scale poster. Okay. Look carefully at it, and there's a big bar scale, black and white stripes. That's it. It's okay. graphically there for you. Okay. So that's a first step. No problem. Hayden. Coastal. Some of them are, but some of them are part of the Celestia story that we're heading towards with our target window. Um, so it depends specifically where you are on the Oregon coast, and I'm probably not going to know unless you have a particular spot. Around Tillamook, uh, um, most famously, there's some Tillamook volcanics that are Eocene, that are that are between 60 and 40. Uh, but I, I'm, I'm learning right along with everybody else. What's special about Tillamook for you? Uh, well, just, you know, grandparents have a big okay. there. Okay, yeah, that, a lot of time there. that works. Yep. But, uh, yeah, recently I just noticed there's a bunch of, like, either pillows or bright cups bombs that yes. sitting there. Yes, yes. Like, to wash up on the beach and find them. Right. Yeah. So, so, I, um... Like Seal Rock, if you know that, that's for Sir Columbia Basalt Group. So there's an example of, you know, of some Tillamook volcanics, which are definitely older than 30. And Seal Rock, for instance, which is definitely this Grand Ron story. Very good. Okay, thank you. Have a good weekend. Thank you for your patience. Let's ask a, ask a few questions, try to answer a few questions. And uh, we won't go on forever, but... We'll do a little live question and answer. If, if you're new to us, we type in uppercase and um, just do a little bit of back and forth here. Um, the room is empty. I think people are ready to... That was a good session, but people are ready to go out and have fun in the sun, I think. Don, is the Pacific Northwest rotation part of the new dating story for the CRBGs? Uh, the, we, we will see, Don, that the Pacific Northwest rotation story uh, goes back easily 50 million years. So there was rotation long before this story. And that's why we have so much folding of these lavas. But there's some, there's some extra things to add there. But I don't, I don't see how the high precision dating we're talking about today helps us with the rotation uh, understanding anymore if I get the, the swing of your question. Let me, let me swing back. Speaking of swinging, what? Lisa, how long does a magnetic reversal take? You must be related to Ryan who wanted to talk a lot about magnetic reversals. Uh, I, I've always meant to do more with magnetic reversals. It's one of those things that everybody seems very interested in. And I think it's fair to say it's quite often... Um, misused or misunderstood, like magnetic reversal flips and things like that, come up in places that don't make a lot of sense. I'm not making much sense personally. Uh, but even basic questions like, are there truly some of these flows that erupted during a reversal? Like in the old literature, that was, that was stated over and over again. Like the ginkgo flow is happening during a reversal. And so you're seeing these magnetic uh, particles within the cooled lava uh, showing this change. I, I, is, that, is that really true? So I can't answer your question specifically. If you Google it, you'll probably get a much better answer than, than mine. Sorry. Janet, how about Cascade Head in Lincoln County? I mean, I'm, I'm pretty out of it with Oregon. 
I got two boys living down there now, but I still I'm very I don't know where that is. I don't know where a lot of these places are in Oregon. Uh, but I guess if we're going down to Oregon next week, I'll learn a little bit more. Uh, Jack, is there signs of the Yellowstone hotspot left in California or something else? That's coming maybe after next week. We will look carefully at a long-lived Yellowstone hotspot story, and some of you who are veterans are like, not again. How many times are you going to talk about that? Well, if you haven't picked up on it yet, I'm trying to learn new things, and so even though there are some themes that will be familiar to us, I will have some, some new uh uh, tidbits from some of these papers, etc. So I guess you'll have to wait a week or two. Thank you. Teresa, oh, this is from Patrick, age seven. Uh, he, he is a person. Uh, hi, Patrick. Is basalt generally harder to date than other rocks? I know they use the interbed ash for this study. I love you. Thank you, Patrick. Yeah, Patrick uh, sent me his uh, notes from the Casbon paper, Patrick, age seven, went through the Casbon paper and underlined things in red ink, et cetera. I saw what you did, Patrick. Good job. I don't think a couple of these folks did their homework, so you're ahead of them. Um, I, I don't have a good answer for you, Patrick. Um, most, some of the most precise dates come from events that happen instantaneously, like a volcanic ash. You know, volcanic ash, Patrick, erupts and then all the ash falls out of the sky. And then it's such a quick event that you can sample that ash and the chemistry is correct to get some rather precise dates. And if it's young enough, Patrick, there's other ways to cross check those ages. Like you've got some living trees nearby or some charcoal layer, or you can get carbon-14 dates on some things. So is basalt typically a hard thing to date? Not according to Emily Cahoon, who is working with those teeny tiny crystals inside of the picture gorge basalts, but that's where my background stops. Thanks for the question. Still kind of hunting around here between live and, and not live. Uh, B.H. Uh, Curley, is it me or are many of these fissures not far from the old North American coast? Uh, it's not just you. Some that know the exotic terrain story know that we have a rather abrupt craton edge here. So uh, that's not your imagination. It's a question of how much you want to attribute to that. You know, if you have magmas coming to the surface, Again, I'm no geochemist, but the thickness and the chemistry of old basement rock of North America's craton is significantly different than the basement rock of some of these exotic terrains. Some that have an ocean island history, some that have a Mexico history. And so, of course, you're influencing the chemistry of your magma as it eats its way up through stuff either uh, west or east of this strontium-706 line. So it is a significant observation. Nice job. Uh, B, B loves science. All fissures always same direction. Is this the case north to south? Why is that? And generally, the, the fissures are kind of as I draw them here. There's a little bit of variation, but in general, it's this story. Um, why are they oriented parallel to each other? Well, that's a surprisingly difficult answer. I've thought a fair amount about this, and I've, I've emailed with a few geologists, Steve Rydell particular in Tri-Cities. I don't want to go too much with this. It's a good question. Apparently, these fissures did not... Okay, so here's some breaking news. You know, this is all about teaching and choices that you make. I've always simply chose to say these fissures are opening up and the lavas are coming out. But if you talk to some folks who've been carefully studying this, they're saying that there's a fabric, or in other words, there's a set of fractures that are already in the bedrock before 20 million years ago due to major plate tectonic interactions. 
And so the, the message is, these are all parallel to each other because there's a parallel set of cracks that predate the flood basalts that are kind of from obliquely subducting an ocean plate and kind of wrenching and cracking. In other words, more regional story. And then the novel idea to me, and I got from Steve Rydell, is that these lavas are just taking advantage of those cracks that are already there. I don't know if I'm making any sense, but... And then you go, well, why? Why are they all parallel 30 million years ago? And I, I don't have a good answer for you. Uh, Lethal Lee says, the Steens flow has a magnetic reversal flip. Yeah, I think that was in the paper, wasn't it? Jennifer's paper? Some of you probably read Jennifer's paper much more carefully than I did. And to that, I should give you a cupcake or something. Do I have any treats for you? I guess I don't. A couple more, and I guess we'll quit. I think I'm going to go sit out in the sun for a while. Uh, we're getting there with this group. I was a little... Um, some of the people that didn't come on the field trip were the same people that kind of have a dead look in their eye today. So I'm, uh, I'm going to keep my eye on them, see if I can get them. Sometimes you can't get everybody, you know. There's many reasons why you can't get students. Uh, but... I'll get as many as I can. I got probably 60% of them totally into the class at the moment. And once you get them, you pretty much got them for the quarter from experience. Two more. Is the, uh, the device nine, is the volume of magma limited only by proximity to the heat source? Can it run dry? Yeah, I don't know. Um, there's some car and siglock contributions now where clearly we have, a, oh, I'm giving away next week's material, I guess. There's geophysics now to, to, to help us see that this mantle plume is a thing. It's not a figment of everybody's imagination. For a while it was unclear, but now we now have tomography to, to show that, that mantle plume. Okay, well, that's, that's a statement. But then is there a, a broad head to the plume? Can the plume kind of drift on the underside of a lithospheric block? And I don't know how much we'll get into that in this class, but sometimes you have magmas that are two states away that maybe you can make a case are from the mantle plume. And in that case, you can transport some of that heat. I, I don't know. So however you worded your question, maybe that was kind of a half answer. KTM Gurley. Could the underlying cracks be part of the exotic terrain story when bits were joining from the West? Uh, I would, yes, I would think of this crack area Generally, I would think of this crack area as the boundary between where we're bringing exotic terrains in and the old North America. Now, as soon as I say that, I realize that some of Emily Cahoon fissures are, you know, a good 100 miles to the west of the true cratonic boundary. Uh, but to, uh, it is safe to say that we need to acknowledge the exotic terrain accretion history here when trying to account for these chemical changes and other things. Now that's, I should say it out loud, I'm nervous. I know that we're gonna get into geochemistry of different kinds of igneous rocks when we get up to the Leavenworth area or the Wenatchee area. And I'm really weak on that stuff. So it's gonna be ugly, I think. I'm gonna be teaching stuff that I barely understand. And that's always scary as an instructor but there's always chance for tremendous growth at the same time. So you gotta be willing to look like an idiot. And that hasn't been a problem so far. <laughs> there's plenty of examples of that. A toast to you. Here's to you for joining us today. Thank you for being with us for session two. Here's to your health. I regularly watch Dr. John Campbell from England, a retired nurse as I understand it, and he makes videos every day 
um, every day. I don't know how this guy does it. Talking about the virus and reading science papers and trying to communicate as carefully as he can. And he is a trusted voice. And I think I saw his video today where he said, there's new rounds of lockdowns in Europe. I just, I'm sorry that that's the case. If you're in France or Spain or Hungary, I, uh, I was very surprised to, to, I guess, learn that many of you are entering another round of lockdowns. Or maybe you're like, wake up, man. I've already been in a lockdown. I've been in Scotland. I've been in lockdown since January 1st or whatever. It feels so different here at the moment. So it's, it's, it's difficult for some of us to remember that many of you are still in this incredible lockdown story. So I'm sorry about that. And let's hope we can outpace this spread with more vaccine. Thank you. Here's to you. And just a programming note in case you didn't catch it. Uh, we did go out on a field trip yesterday. I did use the gizmo. Uh, I filmed here and there. Uh, I'm not going to be fancy with editing. I never am, but I'll, I'll, you know, I'll remove half of it probably. And I'm guessing the video will be 10 to 15 minutes. Just a nice little kind of visual of uh, some of these CRBGs um, and to give you a sense of the vantage area. And in that video, you'll see um, how to get there and how to visit where we filmed if you're interested in doing so. And thanks for playing by the rules. I hope you understand. We haven't had any townies in the classroom and we didn't have any townies try to crash the party yesterday. So thank you. It's mostly a health thing at this point. So I appreciate your willingness to stay away at least for the month of April here. Okay, that's enough for today. Thank you for joining us. I love you and we'll see you on Tuesday live and we'll see you in field video form sometime this weekend. Happy Easter. That's the end. That's that's the end. We're done. I don't know why you're still here. Why am I? Huh? That's it. <laughs>